Today's presentation, uh, I would like to talk to you all about the historic Russian piano pedagogy and uh, how it translates into our modern day times and the current needs. I will mention some important names from the history to give you a background. And then I will direct it towards my, uh, you can say, biggest inspiration, uh, Irina Goren's books, Tales of a Musical Journey. Uh, and I will try to demonstrate how it's built on tr not only traditional sc Russian school, but how it is also modified to the needs of our 21st century pedagogy. Let's see. Oop. Ah, here we are. Okay. First, I would like to talk a little bit about what is the Russian School of play, uh, Piano Playing, its background, and how it is up, applicable to our modern day of private piano lessons, both online and in person. So the phrase, which probably all of you uh, have heard before, Russian School of Piano Playing, what is it? But it has become quite generalized and often confused. Probably most of us would immediately think about serious and successful pianist virtuosos winning competition prizes and remember the older generation of great pianists uh, such as Sergei Rachmaninov, Anton and Nikolai Rubinstein, Sviatoslav Richter, Vladimir Horowitz, Joseph Levine and Joseph Hoffman, among many others. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about the history of the Russian school and how most young musicians receive their musical training in Russia and various parts of Europe. The prominence of the Russian piano music came to the concert stage and began to evolve in the second half of 19th century. One name that is associated with the development of the school is actually a Polish pianist and pedagogue, Theodor Leszczycki. Leszczycki, along with Franz Liszt, was one of the influential teachers of his time. He was a student of Karl Czerny, who, as we know, briefly studied with Beethoven himself. In 1852, Leszczycki left Poland and went to Russia to St. Petersburg, where he lived and taught until 1877. Leszczycki, along with Anton Rubinstein, was one of the founders of the St. Petersburg Conservatory in 1862, where he was the head of the piano department. His famous students uh, include many people, but some names I will mention, Ignaz Parevsky, Artur Schnabel, Beno Moisevich, and Isabel Vingerova, who actually later became a professor at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. Thanks to Lyshatitsky's student and assistant, Malvin Bree, who recorded his principles and the technique and put it into a book called Lyshatitsky Method. And you guys actually already saw it on the opening page. Then, four years later, the Moscow Conservatory was established, co-founded by the brother of Anton Rubinstein, Nikolai Rubinstein, and Prince Nikolai Trubetskoy. So he provided patronage and sponsorship for the school. These conservatories became destinations for musicians to come study with these great teachers and then, in their own right, passed on that knowledge to their own pupils. If we were to summarize, what was the foundation of the Russian piano school demonstrated and taught by the late 19th century pedagogues is that it was not only about playing with big sound as we think of it today, or dry, boring technical exercises, or playing difficult etudes and the repertoire, but rather striving to achieve a beautiful singing tone at the piano. According to Joseph Levine, who, as you know, was a professor at Juilliard for many years, who dedicated a separate long chapter in his book called Basic Principles in Piano Forte Playing to what it means to possess a secret to a beautiful tone, where he explained that the sound has to have a lovely ringing and singing quality. He emphasized the important role that the free wrist and arm play in the production of this good tone 
and that the wrist should be held very flexible so that the weight of the descending hand and arm carried that weight down to the bottom of the key, but without any sensation of blow. And another famous pianist, Joseph Hoffman, advised that we should only see that the wrist is not stiffened unconsciously, as most players do. He then continued to describe how relaxed and loose the arms have to be, with most weight and power being at the fingertip. I will be sharing a lot of quotes today. So another one that is uh, really, really great is by Joseph Hoffman again. He's remembered, and it, it's still used by many Russian teachers, including my own. He said, the sound should be produced as if there were ripe strawberries sitting on a key and you had to push through it. I mean, what a great imagery, especially to share with young students. And the last, uh, a personal favorite quote is by Sergei Rachmaninoff, who described the sensation of playing into the piano as if the fingers grew roots into the keyboard. As you can see, all of these quotes and analogies strive to achieve the same goal in mind, playing with freedom and striving for good sound and a singing tone at all times. Many of these great pianists also had an idea of what a beautiful singing tone should be when they listened to great opera singers, such as great Russian bass Fyodor Shalyapin, he is displayed on the right-hand side picture, or some of the great Italian opera singers like tenor Enrico Caruso. And of course, now we can reference so many amazing opera singers and string players to understand what kind of tone that is and we're looking for. Even though, on one hand, all of these concepts may sound too advanced or too far removed from our area of piano pedagogy working with young children, but a lot of these elements can and actually should be taught to students at a very young age. If we talk about the Russian school of piano playing, I must mention one very important teacher who contributed to the piano pedagogy in Russia and Eastern Europe, and her books are still widely available and used today. Her name was Anna Artabalevskaya. She was born in Kiev, Ukraine in 1905 and studied at the St. Petersburg Conservatory with Maria Yudina. Artabalevskaya later taught at the specialized music school at the Moscow Conservatory. Recently, I actually had a pleasure of listening to a lecture given by a DMA doctoral candidate and concert pianist Olga Ivanova in Moscow, who researched Artabalevskaya's life and her pedagogical contributions. I have learned so much that I actually did not know. What was very unique about Artabalevskaya's teaching style and approach is that all of her students were allowed to come to her home at any time. Parents would drop them off early in the morning for the lesson, and sometimes that lesson would take place much later in the day, almost like, uh, like um, babysitting, kind of. Uh, but the entire time, students were learning by listening to each other's lessons, playing together in ensembles, sight reading, practicing scales together, and of course, listening to music and reading. One of the famous quotes by Artabalevskaya was, I truly believe that the first stage of piano studies is the most important one in developing musicians. It is like planting a seed that could either grow into a big tall tree or dry out and die in the ground. Her method books are still widely used today, as I've mentioned. And in fact, at the end of the presentation, I will show you my original one. It's as old as I am, and it was my very first piano book that I got. You will notice the beautiful artwork that accompanies every piece to inspire young students' imagination and help them hear and experience music and its character first before learning how to play it. Additionally, in the beginning of this book, Artabalevskaya wrote a long note to teachers regarding what the goals should be in teaching young children. 
And then she continued to guide through each piece by giving various ideas and teaching suggestions. And on the slide, you will see two pages actually from this book. Another very interesting thing about Artabalevska's approach was that she often assigned several pieces to a student at once, but only assigned the first or two lines in order to expose the kids to as many different genres and styles as possible. She also created simplified arrangements of very famous pieces, such as Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody No. 2, and that's the one that you will see on the left, by letting the student play the famous melody using two hands or redistribute the melody between two hands. And they learned it. Oh, and she named it simply jumping around because it created a feeling of jumping. The students learned the technique and articulation through simply imitating the character of that famous melody. This piece is actually taught by rote, in case if you were wondering, what about the complicated reading? Could the kids actually read? So originally it was taught by ear. And on the right hand side, it was actually one of my favorite pieces to teach because I think you can already tell how descriptive the picture is. We have a dog who looks quite sad and uh, the little song that go or poem that goes along with it is that his owners left for the summer and it looks like they kind of forgot him behind. And so I would often ask a student, how would you play with this character, you know, with this mood? Um, and uh, you cut the left hand, both hands are in treble clef and the left hand actually traveling and floating across the right hand. So technically it's challenging, but it's entertaining at the same time. I will now tell you a little bit about my own experience studying in Russia and how most students are exposed to music education there. In Russia and most parts of Eastern and Central Europe, the music education is actually systematized and parents who wish to provide music lessons to their child have to audition them at a special music school. Most of these schools were and are still government supported, which meant very low tuition for families. And there are several sometimes per one city. Additionally, there are also specialized music school or boarding schools within the conservatory that are highly selective and are geared towards talented students seeking serious musical training. In my music school, in the city where I lived, and actually you guys can see it on the top picture in the left corner. That's me back in uh, end of 2005, uh, visiting Russia after about six years of not living there anymore. Um, yes, so uh, in my music school where I lived, we had the privilege of taking lessons twice a week with our teacher to work on repertoire and technique. And we also had a shorter third lesson, which for me was usually on Saturday mornings, where we covered other topics such as harmonization, transposition, and accompaniment when I was in upper grades. Additionally, we had lessons in ensemble playing, music theory, ear training twice a week, music literature, and choir. Other kids who played other instruments had orchestra and folk instrument ensembles. Every semester, we had to play in the jury for a grade and had opportunities to partici participate in school's area recitals and special events. My personal favorite concert that I still remember today was playing the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy from the Nutcracker in eight hands with my friends from other studios for a Christmas concert, and I was only 10 years old. My music school was a seven-year program, after which a student could decide to either stop playing and going on to another career, or continue studying in a music college, which is similar to an undergraduate degree. After which, you had a choice to either becoming a music teacher yourself or getting a church job, or you could go on to a conservatory and become a professional pianist or other type of musician. And uh, just briefly, I'll tell you about other pictures. So on the left, on the bottom, that's actually me 
back at that uh, trip that we took in 2005 and sitting in my piano studio and you can see my teacher's chair and a table right in the middle of the room and we usually played on the baby grand in the back but uh, she didn't let me use it this time so i don't know why and then on the right hand side uh, there's just a nice picture of a girl looks like she's playing in a maybe recital and i really enjoyed uh, her sitting position uh, and she looks very poised and at the bottom it looks like uh, it's a a guitar ensemble accompanying probably a uh, voice teacher in the school and that picture is actually not for my school but um, uh, kind of wanted to give you an idea so i will now talk about my personal interest in piano pedagogy and my research of the russian piano school and how i found out about Irina Goren and began researching her book tales of a musical journey as a young student myself, I always knew that I wanted to become a piano teacher after observing my teacher at the school working with other kids. I often stayed at the school and watched those students' lessons with her, and it just felt so inspirational and somehow magical to me. I perhaps wasn't the best student for her, but I loved her teaching other kids. It was, unfortunately, a turbulent time in my life growing up, so music was my safe haven and my escape. Sometimes I even stayed at the music school until late evenings, just listening to all of the sounds coming from different studios and classrooms. Now, going forward to 2010, about 13 years later, I was already doing my master's degree in Ithaca College in New York. I inherited my first full studio at a local community music school where I had to teach a number of complete beginners. I took two semesters of piano pedagogy in college and got to know most of the American beginner methods. With my students at that time, I used Faber Piano Adventures, of course, supplementing with easy classical pieces and uh, some of my older Russian books that I tried to use and various uh, pieces by American popular composers. Somehow, I wasn't happy with my results and just had the feeling that something wasn't going right. No matter how much I tried to be encouraging to my students and trying to make lessons fun, doing theory, some ear training, most of the kids struggled with maintaining a good posture, attention, note reading and they were playing with a lot of tension in their arms and having technical issues that at that time i had trouble solving they could play very simple pieces and songs quite well but as soon as i introduced something different or a classical piece they really struggled for a while well i knew how to I knew how to fix those things in my own playing since I was starting to become a professional concert pianist, but with young students, I felt at loss. On this slide, if you take a look at the pictures, you will see a few examples of the Russian books that I have had access to, and they're still actually widely used in Russia. The so-called Christomatias are collections of various pieces in accordance uh, with every grade of a musical studies at a music school. On the left, under the yellow book, you will see an example of the first type of pieces we would learn as beginners. You can probably already see the issues with this. Boring, no colorful artwork, all of the titles and markings are in Russian, so I would have to translate it for my modern kids, American kids. Unknown songs and melodies for a non-Russian student, they've never heard them before. While the book I mentioned earlier by Anna Tabalevskaya, which was full of beautiful pictures and a teacher's guide in the beginning, these types of methods didn't have anything and they all pretty much looked the same. And uh, on the right, there's another example of a uh, Christomatia for a second grade. So kind of teaching early counterpoint. But, you know, you can imagine a second grader would have a quite a challenging time reading all of that. In my teaching back then, 2010, 2011, uh, besides Faber, 
I also had access to the famous Russian school of piano playing method by Nikolaev. And maybe some of you have seen this one before. It's pretty, uh, pretty popular, I guess. It is translated to English, so that was not a problem with the language, and is uh, readily available on Amazon. However, in the first book by Nikolaev, I realized that the note reading is still quite complicated, where kids had to play simple tunes, but using the notes of two octave ranges, and sometimes more, with different finger numbers. So if some beginner American method offered simple pieces in five finger patterns, the Nikolaev book was already covering almost the entire keyboard and kids were lost. I thought there is no way I was able to read the notes this well when I was young, five or six. Surely there must be a different way of learning. But I just couldn't remember how I did it as a kid. Plus, my kids did not enjoy using the Nikolaev books at all. They had no pictures. They looked boring. At that time of my research, I started, tried to look for something else. And I came across these very nice books by Viktor and Tatiana Shevtsov. That's the one that you see on the right. They published their own Russian-based method in Canada. But the beginner level seemed a bit advanced for my young students. And again, I did not quite understand back then how to introduce all of these complex concepts to young beginners who only took lessons once a week with no additional theory or ear training classes like we had when I was growing up. Sure, they could play the notes and somehow put the hands together, but the sound was stiff and they played with quite percussive touch and we just had difficulty achieving that freedom and artistry. I was very passionate about pedagogy even back then, and I knew that I had to dig deeper and figure all out. So what did I do? I went to YouTube and began my research. Boy, was I happy to find Irina Goren's YouTube page, where she posted videos of her working with her own young students. It completely blew my mind. The amount of information I've learned, tricks and helpful tips that I did not know about before and she graciously shared with the audience. And with how much ease and grace and patience she was able to fix technical issues in her students' playings and also teach them to play the piano with a beautiful tone and play with relaxed wrist and arms. To me, she looked like a magician. It was not just about note reading and rhythm and putting the hands together, but rather she showed the student how to recognize a good, beautiful tone from a bad one. So just like in the quote we saw earlier, she focused on the basics of technique, which resulted in a good sound production. And she taught the student to listen and to play with artistry and expression. So I finally, got in touch with Irina back in 2010, early 2011, and ordered one of the first editions of the Tales books, and they were still kind of in the works. So let me tell you a little bit about Irina and her background, in case you're not familiar with who she is. She was born also in Kiev, Ukraine, and studied at the Kiev Music College and Kharkov Conservatory. With over 30 years of teaching experience, she established a reputation as one of the most prominent pedagogues of children in the United States and abroad. In 2019, she started teaching piano pedagogy and piano performance in College of Chinese and Asian Arts in Chengdu, China. And she frequently conducts workshops and master classes all over the world. Her books Tales of a Musical Journey is the culmination of Goren's vast education and teaching experience. She actually, uh, when we talked a little bit, she was in exactly the same boat, so to say, back in the 90s when she first moved to the United States and uh, she had a little bit of an adjustment period as well that I was talking about. So this series uniquely blends European and American teaching methods to prepare beginning piano student for classical repertoire. 
These books have already been sold in 90 countries and translated to more than 15 languages, with more coming. One thing that is important to clarify is that Irina did not create a method. What she did was systematize the vast knowledge that was passed on to her by her teachers in Ukraine who studied in the Russian school, who were inspired by Leshetitsky, Isabel Vingerova, Heinrich Newhaus, and Anna Artobalevskaya. And what she did is that she successfully introduced all of these complicated concepts to a modern day student in a very organic and logical manner. Additionally, Irina included a teacher's guide to go along with the books that teachers like myself can read to better understand. And of course, she offers recorded teaching demonstrations. We have access to her YouTube page and she now also has the Goran Piano Institute offered virtually. When the Tales books became more and more popular in the US and abroad, more teachers were interested to find out how was she getting these wonderful results with students. Irina began to give various workshops and master classes for teachers. In fact, just this past summer during the pandemic, Yulia Rupcova and myself actually enrolled in her online pedagogy course along with over 120 other piano teachers from all over the world. In this course, we covered a myriad of topics regarding successful teaching. We went through all of the chapters of both books of the tales. We were able to get feedback for our own teaching and playing demonstrations. It was in-depth, eye-opening, and extremely helpful experience. So before we get into the books, I wanted to address a few important points that we as teachers should be aware of. This, I hope, will help us understand better how the pedagogical concepts are approached in tales. What I've learned that it is not enough to simply buy the books and try to use them without understanding the goals in mind. Perhaps understand ourselves how to teach children to hear a beautiful sound, why one way of playing the piano can produce an unpleasant, hard, percussive touch, or on the opposite side to have a touch that lacks color and is very surfacy. How to help students to feel a steady pulse and playing pieces with different rhythms. How to instill good technical skills and habits in order to play with artistry from the very first lesson. And lastly, how can we help the student achieve freedom and inspire imagination? For the next few slides that you will see, I borrowed these ideas from our class and I just modified them a little bit and I wanted to share them with you and I hope you find them helpful. Perhaps as we already know, majority of beginners struggle with weak memory, lack of imagination and interest sometimes, lack of focus and concentration, muscle tension, underdeveloped musical ear, lack of the feel and rhythm and beat. Main goals in teaching children perhaps should be inspiring imagination and creativity, appreciation of classical music and then learning to play in other genres, discipline, goal setting, problem solving, developing musical abilities and technical skills that will help them down the road. And this one was my personal favorite, who we are as piano teachers. Pianist, educator, storyteller, entertainer, singer, disciplinarian sometimes, a doctor, and of course an accountant. And I would add um, a little bit of a fairy, fairy godmother. <laughs> One of the biggest points that Irina discusses with uh, teachers is understanding the important role of the parents in musical studies and how to engage them in child's progress and practice at home. To me, that was also a really, really big uh, eye-opening experience. One important thing, when I personally now interview the potential student, I do always ask how committed the parents will be to piano lessons and practice at home. 
I try to explain to them that to, in order to see good and fruitful results, the children, especially the very young ones, will need to have parental supervision in the lessons, taking notes, perhaps videotaping. Now on Zoom, I often record the lessons myself just by click of a button. And sometimes I additionally videotape teaching demonstrations in my own time of new concepts or perhaps new pieces and share them with parents for review. I have another good quote by Joseph Hoffman that I found very inspirational. Dear teachers, do not start with the position of the hand, but start with the condition of mind. I thought this quote actually perfectly summarizes the ideas behind the concept of details books, which I will share with you. There are several books in the Tales series. The first two are called Tales of a Musical Journey, and there are two books in the series meant for the beginner level. These are written in form of a chapter book and use fairy tale settings and characters in order to introduce and expand musical concepts. These stories I find are perfect for a young students because they involve their imagination and help them remember the information better. It just sticks somehow. And of course, with my older beginners, I still use the same books. We call them technique books, but I just don't read the stories anymore. The main goal of these books is to teach a student the correct touch, reading notation, listening, work on imagination, and combining all of the skills together. The primary focus of book one of Tales is to learn the necessary technical skills through freedom and flexibility of the upper body parts, shoulders, arms, wrists, and fingers. During the first lesson, students will learn about relaxation through various exercises away from the piano when a teacher can easily pair it up with some music. And it's also been perfect for online lessons with the little ones just to kind of like break the ice. And I would turn on music, screen share it, and they will be watching me and we'll doing all sorts of fun activities and they seem to enjoy it. If you're curious about any of these, I'll be happy to share at the end. The kids immediately will learn about proper posture and sitting using various pictures and analogies. I usually send similar pictures and instructions to parents to print them out and put them in kids' folders as reminders. The entire first book of tales is based on short pieces and songs using a non legato playing. And student first learns to play non legato articulation with the strongest finger of the hand, which is finger number three. Every new concept and note reading are gradually introduced in a sequence as the student build on the basic skills. The rhythm is introduced and developed through clapping, marching, counting out loud, I sometimes make them dance, and playing with the accompaniment. Now, on Irina's new website, which is so cool, she offers all of the musical tracks that accompany each song for free. And just recently, she published a teacher's accompaniment book that you can use along with students when we're back in person. It is important for the young students to learn about relaxation and keeping flexible wrists and arms from the very beginning. And during the very first lesson, they will already learn how to coordinate breathing with keeping the arms and the wrists loose. <clears throat> One of the breathing and hand coordination exercises the students learn is in, called the weeping willow tree exercise. This is when the student leaves their hand freely on the lap, takes a big breath, make sure there's no tension, their upper body. And then with a deep breath, they lift the arm up from uh, with leading of the wrist up to the keyboard. And we repeat it several times. We do that exercise at every lesson in the beginning, and I encourage the parents to do so the same at home. It's very simple, but it's very effective. When learning about proper hand shape, uh, Irina actually doesn't anymore use the analogy of holding an apple or a ball as what we are usually do, right? Uh, because it actually immediately creates a stiffened sensation in the hand. 
And a child, especially a young one, can lock themselves in the concept of shaping something with their fingers, which creates muscle tension. One exercise I get very simple but effective to do instead is to learn to hold a pencil, letting the fingers stay together by creating a naturally shaped hand without squeezing and forcing. And I would often have my students also do a tap of the finger joint on top of the eraser and would say knock knock who is there, inspector, inspector who, inspector who comes and make sure your knuckles don't collapse. They laugh, have a great time and we solve the issue. Other unique ideas that Irina developed and introduced with the Tales books are various pedagogical toys and aids that are available on her website that can be used during the lessons to make them more fun. If you're curious about any of these, I have a bag of goodies over here and I'll be happy to share them with you later after the presentation. And if we have time, I would like to share a video which Irina actually made with one of her own students showing us how she teaches to play with relaxed arms, supporting arms, and playing with a good tone, and teaching the fingers not to collapse. So, hopefully it will work. All right, today we are going to work on manipulating and helping students with the hand manipulating the fingers and the wrist. One of the most important things to support their forearms so they don't go down too low. So with my left hand, I support her forearm right here and I can move it wherever I want. Up and down everywhere. I can also help her to relax the wrist if I hold my hand a little bit like that. So from here, I can move here and help her to relax and drop her hand down. Also, when we start playing, I want to make sure the knuckles don't collapse. Some kids like to collapse them. So what I do, let's straighten our fingers. I grasp right here and slightly pull and she immediately makes a very wonderful hand position. Let's do it one more time. Pull. And again. Up. Pull. Very good. To help fingers to keep nail joint rounded, I support with my thumb underneath and with my fingers three and two on the top of the nail. So when we play, I push a little bit out her joint and help her to hold firmly. Relax, relax. So when I feel a little stiffness, I can help her to relax. Relax with my hands. Mm -hmm. When I want to add a little more weight to her plane, I'll place my hand above hers, grasp her fingers right here, and we'll play together. So in addition to her weight, she'll feel mine too. Keep holding, honey. Yes. So now with my right hand, I help with the wrist. until student creates a habit of relaxing and feeling the hand in good shape and very naturally relaxed, we need to help them a lot. Hope that was helpful. So it was so mesmerizing watching that woman teach. Um, and of course, uh, we'll say, well, right now we're virtual. So how can we grab our ha uh, students' hands? And some of us still teach 100% online. Um, I, with some of my more involved parents who do diligent job with uh, videotaping, sitting at lessons, taking notes, I do train them to do the same. So I would 
kind of we turn the whole lesson into a little workshop. I explain to the parent what to do, um, and then they happy to assist, and it makes it really quite remarkable results. Um, now I will briefly walk you through uh, the second book of tales, and you will see the example of some of the pieces from there. Where students continue to develop technical skills, but now working on legato and staccato articulations. First, they learn to play two note slurs and gradually moving on to the three and more notes, always making sure that the wrist is involved while they're shaping the music. On one hand, it may appear quite simple because two note slurs, what is the big deal? But you'll realize that with young children, they would often uh, either collapse their fingers, their hand is all over the place, uh, or the second note always comes off too loud. But by this time, they're more prone and understand what it means to listen. So they try to avoid those mistakes as much as they can. Students continue learning the musical notation, which now ranges of four octaves, and they learn to play pieces with eighth notes. This book has a wide range of various folk tunes, including American popular folk songs and easy classical examples, which have interesting and descriptive titles to inspire the imagination. Throughout the years, Many teachers were inquiring about supplemental pieces for the students to play in recitals that went along with the concept of the tales books. A wonderful American pianist and composer, Paula Dreher, introduced little jams for piano for primary level, which are beautiful pieces taught by rote. She teaches these pieces, uh, I teach, excuse me, these pieces both by ear I love allowing students to explore different sounds, dynamics, learn the topography of the keyboard, but I also gradually teach them how to read those notes as well. And at the end of this presentation, I would love to share with you a video of one of my beginner piano students playing one of the pieces from there. And I also wanted to introduce other authors who composed various piano pieces and duets uh, that also go along line with the Tales uh, book. Uh, they're very beautiful, expressive, and some fun pieces. And um, I often would choose some of the longer ones to use in local competitions and um, like our, our Raleigh PM Teachers Association and some online competitions. So they're very effective for children. Um, and so before I end, I do have some books that I would like to show that maybe we can save for the end, but I would like to share with you a video of my student, uh, Michaela. She's six years old. Uh, her brother actually was studying with me for probably about five years already, and she was finally old enough to begin her lessons this year. I haven't taught her in person at all. So this is all online, and her dad's been such a great help um, and I hope you will enjoy the piece. It's called uh, Current by Paula Dreher.